And tonight is, as Padma said, one of our Thursday evening lectures. And I'm really, really pleased to be able to introduce Anne Charmantier as our speaker tonight. Anne is an evolutionary ecologist holding a senior position at the Center for Functional and Evolutionary Ecology at, in Montpellier in France. I'm very jealous of where she lives. Her main research interests are focused on understanding how, how the mechanisms that are involved in the evolution of adaptive traits, especially in the context of really rapid environmental change driven by us human beings. Since 2007, she's been managing a very long-term project that actually started in 1976, looking at data and samples from uh, blue tits in Corsica and great tits in the herbist and forest environments of, of the south of France. This data is contributing to her research on urban evolutionary biology, local adaptation, plasticity, senescence, ecological genomes, and sexual selection, to name just a few of the incredible gamut of evolutionary ecology things that she's interested in. She's really, she's a, she's a pioneer in the study of quantitative genetic approaches to wild populations to study both adaptive and non-adaptive responses to climate change, but also importantly, particularly in today's world, urbanization. So Anne, thank you very, very much for coming in. We're really looking forward to hearing your talk, which you can see the title there, Adaptation and Maladaptation in the Urban Habitat. Thanks a lot for coming along, Anne. Thank you. Thank you very much for this introduction. I'm honored to present this evening talk for the Linnean Society, even if her physical presence in London would have been really lovely. So um, I'm going to talk this evening about evolution in action in cities and provide a glimpse of the ongoing research in this field. As an evolutionary ecologist, I study microevolution, that is evolution on the short time scale versus uh, macroevolution, which would have been uh, studying how species appear and disappear. So I study evolution in um, the way that it happens in a few generations and particularly in context of anthropogenic change. So as a short introduction, I wanted to uh, talk to go back to the core concept of my research, which is the evolution by natural selection. And this idea that organisms evolve across generations under the action of natural selection was first born, of course, you all know, in the mind of Charles Darwin, following his observations as a, a naturalist on biological diversity, for example, the shape and size of the, the beak in 14 species of um, finches that he observed and he described during his trips to the Galapagos. Now, following the emergence of what we could call quite a qualitative theory stated by Charles Darwin, quantitative approaches then flourished. And on the one hand, with mathematical modeling emerging in the 1920s, uh, with work, for example, by Fisher, Holden, and Wright, you have here the equation that predicts the evolution of allelic frequencies following a selection event. And then some 20 years later uh, with experimental evolution in the lab. Experimental evolution allowed to generalize empirical tests of the theories of population genetics and population um, and ecological genetics. So from Darwin to fin F Fisher, uh, within these bodies of theories and experiments, well, studies in the wild, uh, finally, someone lagged behind in uh, contributing to the knowledge of natural selection. And during several decades, it's actually in the plant and animal breeding and domestication sciences that we found the best examples of microevolution that is outside the lab. And also it's in this field of domestication and breeding science that we made the best progress in understanding and prediction uh, rapid evolution. In particular, quantitative genetics developed tools such as the breeder equations here. So the breeder equation is a very simple equation that predicts the uh, evolutionary response of a trait based on the estimation of the heritability of this trait and the estimation of selection. So for example, if you take a farmer that has a um, livestock um, managed uh, with certain uh, choices of selection, well, this farmer can actually predict um, the uh, increase in milk yield production based on the, the heritability of milk uh, production and based on the selection that the farmer decides to um, 
to incur on his livestock. Now, in the wild, these kind of equations don't always work very well. And the reason why is that, uh, well, heritability and selection are both influenced by many factors that can vary much more outside the laboratory or outside domestic species. In particular, these processes here are very, these processes are very important. So gene flow, which is uh, the dispersal of individuals between different habitats, genetic drift, and the um, uh, mutations that can be genetic mutations or epigenetic mutation, all these processes will, will impact heritability. And the environment and its heterogeneity in time and space will also impact both heritability and selection. So this complexity builds around uh, heritability and selection makes uh, understanding and predicting the evolutionary response much more difficult in the wild than it, it is outside. We do, however, have quite a few very good examples of um, evolutionary responses that were witnessed and observed and measured in wild population. This here is probably one of the best and most ancient examples where we had a complete picture on natural selection. Probably all of you know about this, and it's the rapid evolution of the melanic form of the pepper moth, uh, Biston betularia. So in 19th century uh, Britain, the coal fire manufacturing industry blackened the trees in, in England. And following this blackening of the trees, uh, observations were made of a new uh, form of Biston betularia, which is the melanic form here, the black, the black morph of, this, um, uh, of the pepper moth. And because of natural selection, this black morph spread across the whole northwest of England and North Wales. And how was natural selection acting? Well, natural selection was acting through predation because of course, when the blackening of the trees uh, made the black morth um, more cryptic, then the birds could see the white morth be better and they were predating the white morths more than they were predating the black morths. Now, what is remarkable about this example is that there was in fact reverse evolution after the 1960 legislation to improve air quality, the trees became white again. And so natural selection favored uh, the white morphs over the black morphs. And so these uh, melanic morphs started to disappear across the whole country. So, as I said, this was a remarkable example where we had a novel human-induced environmental conditions that favored the emergence and selection of a new mutation, and it spread across most of England and, and North Wales. And um, this mutation allowed for rapid evolutionary response of the color morph, and even more excitingly, we had the reverse evolution. Now, uh, what we noticed and gradually realized in the last two decades is that these cases of rapid evolution are particularly prevalent in response to drastic changes that are induced by humans. And cities represented here with the um, city of uh, Fiorence in, in Italy are areas where uh, they have a concentration of characteristics that are likely to trigger many evolutionary responses. So to cite only a few, cities have high fragmentation, and this means that dispersal can be more difficult for most organisms, and so it might decrease gene flow. High fragmentation might also increase uh, genetic drift. Cities have high um, levels of spatial heterogeneity, which can change many of these processes, especially heritability and selection. And cities are a concentration of environmental stress. And by this, I mean a cocktail of different environmental features that will change in cities compared to natural habitats and can be challenging for organisms. In particular, you probably know that cities um, have a higher temperature compared to natural areas uh, nearby. This is called the urban heat island effect. There's of course the air pollution, the water pollution, uh, the disturbance by pedestrians and their pets, the disturbance by cars, and then light pollution and sound pollution. So all these cocktail again of uh, changes in characteristics of the, um, the city make this a particularly good place to expect novel selection and so um, novel evolutionary responses. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to present three examples of such rapid evolution. Each of these example is linked to one characteristic of the city. And the first one here is water pollution. <laughs> 
So the uh, stage of this study are the, um, is, is the US Atlantic coast estuaries. Uh, and here you have a picture of New Bedford Harbor, which was one of the first harbor where um, it was noticed that most of the fishes in these harbors uh, were dying. And this is due to um, uh, the sites being contaminated by complex mixtures of persistent industrial pollutants and especially PCBs. So most of the fishes um, in these estuaries uh, in the US Atlantic coast were dying apart from this one species, the Atlantic killifish, which seems to be present uh, still in most of these, um, these harbors. And so what the authors of this study did is that they sampled the, the fish in four different harbors, which are T1, T2, T3, and T4 here, and in four areas that were in the same estuary close by, but uh, didn't have this high level of pollution that the harbor had. These are S1 to S4 areas here. And so when you sample fishes in these eight areas and you place them in increasing levels of PCBs, what you see is that very quickly, um, the fish that come from the S areas, so they are the sensitive areas, they die very quickly. So this is survival here, and survival drops um, very quickly uh, to levels where basically all the fish die at certain PCBs temperature um, uh, concentration. But at this concentration, the T uh, population, so these are the tolerant one, uh, seems to be surviving quite well. Although if you increase the uh, concentration of PCBs, they, they start having higher mortality as well. And so the authors show that the fish uh, in these harbors were 8,000 times more resistant to chemical pollution, and that this resistance was due to high levels of standing genetic variation in this fish particularly. So compared to the other fish species in the harbors, this fish had a high level of genetic variation, which allowed for an, um, a rapid adaptation of the fish. And it was also demonstrated that it was the same molecular pathway that led to tolerant populations surviving in these different harbors. So this was my first example. And the second example of a successful story of um, adapting at a short time scale is in the context of the urban heat island effect that I mentioned before. So as you probably know, in cities, temperatures can be as high as three to four degrees to up to 12 degrees higher than in nearby uh, natural areas. And this particularly at night. And in this study, they looked at this urban heat island effect and um, uh, in the case of the uh, crested anole, Anolis cristatellus, on the island of Puerto Rico. And so what they did uh, is that they went and sampled uh, lizards in four different localities on the island of Puerto Rico. And in these four localities, they sampled uh, lizards both in urban populations in gray and in nearby forests uh, here in black. The first thing they did is that they looked at the genetic background of the lizards from these four areas. And this was to know whether the city lizards um, were communicating in terms of dispersal and gene flow. So whether a new city would have been colonized by lizards from the other cities or by lizards from the forest. And if you look here at, at this genetic background, so each color here res represents one genetic background, you can see that in a given locality, uh, the lizards uh, from the forest and from the urban habitat have a similar genetic background. And that means that these city lizards come from independent colonization of the different urban areas. And then they placed these lizards in different temperatures and they looked at the minimum critical temperature um, that the individuals could survive to or, or um, still be um, in, in good shape. And what you can see is that in the four localities here, each time the urban lizards had a higher uh, critical temperature compared to the, for, uh, to the forest lizards. So what this shows here is that there is a parallel response in the different cities. And they actually showed that there is this parallel signature of selection due to one protein si synthesis gene associated with heat tolerance. And because of this independent colonization, the authors kind of stipulated that this means there, there was parallel evolution whereby the same gene was favored in the four different cases.
My third and final example of the success story of uh, adaptation to the urban environment um, has the scene of Montpellier, my hometown. So this is a picture of the city. And um, it is linked to the fact that, uh, that a city, as I said, offers very high fragmented landscape for most of the organisms that inhabit the, the cities. And here, fragmentation was studied uh, in the different vegetation patches of the cities, the very small vegetation patches that you find. For example, here you have um, an alley of uh, trees. And at the bottom of each of these trees lies a very small uh, patch of vegetation. And in these very small patches of vegetation, you find this species, Crepisanta. So in English, it's hoaxbeard. I discovered yesterday the English name. <laughs> um, and the particular, the, the characteristic of this plant species is that it produces two types of seeds. So it classically produces a high amount of these high dispersal seeds. And they are high dispersal because they have this little parachute. That means that the wind can very easily take this, this seed and bring and brings it far away from the mother plant. But they also, to a less, lesser extent, produce these low dispersal seeds that are much heavier. And so because of their weight, they tend to just drop at the bottom of the mother plant. So what uh, Pierre-Olivier Sheptou and his team did here in Montpellier is that they sampled four different rural areas where this plant was found and uh, seven different urban plots where this plant was found as well. And they brought all these plants in a common garden environment in the greenhouses here outside the lab. And so that meant that they could uh, um, grow the plants for several generations in exactly the same conditions. And so what this common garden environment experiment allowed to do was then to measure the percentage of uh, production of high dispersal speeds and low dispersal seeds uh, in these two uh, types of plants that came from rural and urban habitats. And what they found is that in the rural habitat, the plants on average produce 10% of the uh, low dispersal seeds, whereas in the um, urban habitat, they produce a much higher percentage. And this is because in cities, if you produce seeds that disperse quite far away, well, these seeds will have a very high chance of ending up in an impervious surface where it's not favorable at all for the seed to grow into a plant. So in fact, um, it's much, fav much more favorable to to produce more low dispersal seed that will be able to grow at the bottom of the, uh, the mother plant. And the authors from this study estimated that this was actually a very fast evolution since it seems that it happened in five to 12 generations. So we now know that evolution can happen very fast in cities uh, in, in an adaptive way. Now, of course, I cherry picked these uh, three previous examples. Um, since they were clear demonstration of a rapid genetic evolution in the urban context. But in fact, we don't have so many. Um, this year, uh, Max Lambert and colleague published these, this uh, review in, in Trends of Ecolo in Ecology and Evolution. And in this review, they reviewed all the studies that had attempted to test for adaptive evolution in cities. And their conclusion was that we presently have six comprehensive examples of speed species adaptively evolving to urbanization. So six is not a lot, and I presented three of them to you earlier. Um, and this is because of the complexity of the urban environment, of course, but also the complexity of demonstrating evolution, and that is demonstrating a genetic change uh, when we see a changing in the phenotypes. This is something that we have tackled in this book published in 2020 about urban evolutionary biology. And in particular, we talked about the difficulty of demonstrating adaptive evolution in a chapter that we wrote with my postdoc, Charles Perrier, where we proposed kind of a roadmap of how to go about studying adaptive evolution in urban environments. So I'm going to walk you through this graph, uh, but I'm also then going to use it as uh, an outline of the presentation of the results that we've had in our study of the great tit in the city. So when you go about studying adaptive evolution, you usually start by making an observation of phenotypic divergence. And by this, I mean, you will observe that the organism that you're studying is different in the city compared to natural habitats. I will use here the leitmotiv of the pepper moth, where there was this observation of the, the black morph um, 
the melanic morph uh, following the revolution, uh, the industrial rev revolution. Um, so you start by observing these two morphs. Well, as an evolutionary ecologist, the first question that I will ask myself if I start seeing these two morphs appearing is whether the um, this emergence of a new phenotype in the city is adaptive. And so to answer the question of adaptiveness, we have a tool which is called selection analysis, which basically means that we're looking at whether the differences in the morphs here is related to fitness. So whether it's related to the survival or to the reproduction of the species in the novel environment. And then if we find that it's adaptive, we can then go on and ask the second question here is, which is whether this difference in morphs here is due to a, plastic, a plasticity, so a plastic individual response where, whereby a given individual can change its color depending on which environment it's going to be placed in, or whether it's actually a genetic uh, determinism. And so it's the genes of the individuals that will determine its color. So this question can be addressed by different experimental approaches. And in particular, I've talked about several examples of common garden experiments. Uh, you can also do cross fostering where um, you exchange the uh, individuals from the two different habitats. Um, and then this will tell you whether if in a common garden experiment, the uh, differences are maintained, there's, there's a very good chance then that there's a heritable processes and especially genetic process involved in the divergence that, that you observe. And then finally, for those of you interested in genes and genomics, then if there is a genetic determinism, but actually even if there is a plastic uh, determinism, you might be interested in understanding which genes are involved. And so in the genomics area, there are different ways to go about this, and it depends a lot on your budget. So you can start by targeting, targeting uh, candidate genes. So for example, in birds, we know of genes that are related to um, bird personality and human avoidance, and, and what we call the shyness, boldness um, spectrum in birds and in humans, in fact. These genes, uh, CR a CERT and DRD4 have been shown to differ between uh, city and forest birds in great tits um, in the black swan and black birds. You can also look at the whole genome, but looking at little pieces of the whole genome. And that's what rat sequencing does. Uh, it provides data on what we call SNPs, with our, which are really SNPs of the, uh, the genomic identity of each individual. Uh, and as an example here, I want to cite remarkable work by Jason Munchi South and, and uh, his group in New York, where they have studied several rodents and especially the white footed mice. And they have shown that if they screen the whole genome um, using, I think it was 150,000 uh, SNPs from transcriptome data from these. Um, uh, these little, little mice, well, they, they see that mice in New York City are genetically very different from mice in their rural areas, but within New York City, they're even different between the different parks. So you, if you have the SNPs, so the genetic identity of uh, these mice um, in a given area, you can actually attribute um, the, this genome to a given park in, in um in New York. And finally, and this is kind of to close the loop with my example on the pepper moth, if you have a lot of money and if you have an organism uh, that has a, a, a small genome, you can also do whole genome sequencing. And this is what has been done with the pepper moth. This is how uh, they elucidated the uh, true uh, genetic mechanism whereby there was very fast evolution in the black morph, and it was due to a transposable element that was responsible for this melanism and allowed for the rapid evolution. Okay, so as, as I said before, um, I'm now gonna switch to my own research uh, on the great tit in the urban environment, and I'm gonna use this roadmap as kind of an outline of the dis different steps that we took in studying this bird in the city environment. This has been an ongoing project for the last almost 10 years, and it's very much a collaborative project. So here I wanted to thank all my colleagues here that have contributed in the past or in the present to this study. There's actually many, many more people involved because every year we have a lot of field workers that work with us. And a lot of the results I'm going to present tonight are from the PhD project that finished this year of Odd Kézerg and a postdoc of uh, Charles Perrier here. <laughs> 
Okay, so a few um, a few information about the background of this project. It's uh, it started in 1991 in the forest of La Rouvière, which is uh, northwest of Montpellier here on the map. And here you have an aerial view of part of the forest and each little green dot is a nest box. So we study great tits in nest boxes as many, many groups in Europe do. And this is because it allows us to capture the birds easily, but also to monitor the whole reproduction of the birds quite easily. In 2011, we started a similar monitoring project uh, in the city of Montpellier. And so we set up nest boxes in eight different areas of Montpellier. Here you have one of these areas, and I'm not sure whether you can see, but each dot associated with a little number represents also a nest box. And what was really important for us is that we set up nest boxes in parks, such as here in this area, but also in each area of the city, we also tried to set up nest box in parks, but also in the streets or more uh, urbanized areas. So we wanted to have this whole spectrum of the um, urban, uh, urban gradient. To measure this urban gradient, I'm not gonna uh, talk too much about this, but we, we had measure, measures on light pollution, we had measures on pedestrian um, disturbance, car disturbance, and also the vegetation covered uh, the vegetation cover that was measured with uh, aerial images. So um, here I'm representing not, not the eight sites, but the five different sites that will be used later on for the genetic analysis. So each little dot here is a bird that was sampled and used for the genetic analysis I'm go going to present. And uh, you have the forest of La Rouvière here, and then five different sites within the city. And in these uh, five sites, as you can see, uh, there is a gradient or, of urbanization, whereas, for example, in the zoo, most of the area is uh, not urbanized at all. There is mostly vegetation around. But then in other areas, you have a variation in the, in the urbanization of um, each nest box. Okay, so a few pictures about our field work. Uh, this is a ringing station where you have all the tools needed to ring the bird, but also to, to make all the measures. So in terms of morphology, uh, we measure very classically measured traits in birds. So tarsus length of the bird gives us an idea of its, um, its height, its size, general size. Then we measure weight, which gives us an idea of the general body condition. And we measure wing length and tail length. And I'm going to present results on relative wing length. That means how big the wing length, how uh, tall the wing length is compared to the whole body size. We also measure life history because we monitor what's happening in nest boxes. Uh, and in particular, we know when the birds lay their first egg, which is the laying date. We know how many eggs they lay, which is the clutch size. And then we have the number of hatchlings and the number of fledglings, which is a measure of the reproductive effort and reproductive success. And then uh, one particularity of our group is that we're also interested in behavior and physiology. And I'm showing here three examples of traits we're measuring. So uh, handing aggression is a score of how the bird is aggressive towards the manipulator. And expiration score is measured with quite a complex apparatus called the open fields box, which is represented here in this picture. So you place the bird in a little cage and then the bird can go and open much wider area. And here is a video recorder that um, basically films what's happening inside the box where the light is controlled and everything. And what we can see is that what we have seen over the years is that uh, some birds, when placed in this novel environment, uh, they have um, very uh, fast exploration and other birds take their time and they explore much more slower, but much more thoroughly this new environment. And we know that this, um, this trait, the expiration score is repeatable and heritable. So uh, if you have parents that have high expiration scores, there's a good chance that their offspring will also have high expiration scores. And then finally, we also measure uh, physiological traits such as the breath rate under constraint. Okay, so let's start with this roadmap and some results on, the, on our study. So uh, let's start with the phenotypic investigation. Uh, 
Previously, in the examples I've given, um, people have studied one trait. So for example, the, th the thermal tolerance in the lizards, in the anoles, um, or uh, the survival in the killifish. Uh, we didn't really know where to start. We knew that the birds in the city were probably going to be different, but we decided to measure all the classic traits that I presented previously. And what we found in terms of phenotypic divergence, and by that I mean how different the city birds are compared to the forest birds, is that basically all the traits that we measured showed a difference. So um, here I'm going to present the results in kind of a dichotomous way. Uh, and by dichotomous, I mean that I will contrast birds from the forest with birds from the city, but we also did analysis with uh, the urban gradient as continuous straight, and it shows the same results, so I'm not going to show the details. So basically birds in the city, they are smaller, uh, they have lower body mass, so they are also lighter after controlling for their size, and they have shorter wing and tail lengths uh, compared to their body size, uh, their uh, overall size as well. In terms of life history, birds in the city, they tend to lay eggs four days earlier than birds in the forest. They have a smaller clutch size, so they have around two eggs less in their clutches compared to um, a, for a bird uh, in the forest. And they have a smaller number of hatchlings and smaller number of fledglings. And in terms of behavior and physiology, we showed that they have a higher uh, handling aggression, uh, they have a faster exploration when placed in the novel open field and fast, faster breath rate under constraint. So you might have noticed that some of these titles here are in, are in bold. And this is because when we published this res these results in 2017, these were the significant differences. Now that we have four extra years of data because we're continuing the monitoring every year, all these traits are actually now significantly different between the forest and the city birds. And as I said before, we, had, we have similar results along the urban gradient as well. So because I told you about evolution being about a trait being heritable and being selected, of course, the first thing we need to know is whether these traits are heritable. Uh, so uh, whether there is a transmission, a genetic transmission of the, of the genes for these traits between parents and offspring. And uh, when we run quantitative genetic analysis on these four traits here, which is where we started because uh, these three traits, we have a little bit less data. We found that uh, these four traits are heritable. Um, and so a heritability here, for example, of 0.26 means that if you look at variation in aggression across the whole population, so between individuals, 26% of the variation across individuals will be due to the genes carried by the individuals. And the rest is due to the environment that also determines in part their handling aggression. So there's, it seems to be that we have here strong divergence in traits that are heritable, which means that we could have um, here a response to selection. If selection differs between city and forest, then we might have actually these all these differences uh, could be due to the fact that great tits have evolved to be a different ecotype in the city compared to the forest. And this is the set where uh, it les led us to the second step of this analysis where we wanted to understand whether the differences observed in the morphology and the life history were adaptive or not. And here are results from Odd Kizyag's PhD. So I'm gonna present here selection gradients and perhaps some of you have never seen uh, such estimates before, but I'm gonna walk you through these results quite slowly. So this is a reminder of results I've shown previously that birds in the city are smaller. And the question here is whether this is adaptive. And by that, I mean whether selection is favoring smaller birds in the city. Okay, so these are the linear selection gradients. What a selection gradient mean is that if you have a positive selection gradient, it means selection is favoring positive, uh, larger values for these traits. So here, for example, there's a significant, indicated by the star here, a significant positive selection for um, tarsus length in forest males. So the males will always be the circles and the females always be the triangle. And the forest is green and the urban is kind of purple grayish. So here you have positive selection favoring taller males and negative selection favoring lighter males, both in the forest. Uh, 
all the other selection gradients here are non-significant, which means that morphology doesn't matter too much for the bird's fitness. And so, as you recall, birds in the city are smaller, uh, they're lighter, and they have shorter wing and shorter tail lengths. And there's no evidence here that this is because selection is favoring these characteristics, right? In terms of life histories, um, as you may recall, birds, oh, wait a minute, I need to look at the time because I think I'm taking too much time. We started at seven, okay. Um, so birds in the city lay earlier and smaller broods in the city. Well, in fact, they lay um, earlier and yet they are not selected to lay earlier, although they are selected to lay earlier in the forest. And in the city, they have smaller clutch size and yes, they are selected to, uh, for larger broods. So it's the birds that have larger broods that have more offspring in the following generation. And in terms of behavior, I'm not sh showing here the details, but all the behaviors that are uh, shown in the, the city birds, for example, faster expiration are associated with lower survival. So what we have here is that the phenotypic divergence that we observed, all the city characteristics don't seem to be due to an adaptive response because they're not aligned with selection. Okay, I'm gonna skip the part on the experimental approaches because we did several things, but what we haven't done yet is a common garden. As you may guess, putting several plants or several lizards even in the same environment uh, for them to grow in the common environment. It's not easy, but it's feasible. But doing the same with a bird is much more difficult. We are going to attempt to do this next, next spring. So perhaps I will be able to tell you about it in a couple of years time. But I'm going to switch directly to this genomic approach as the kind of last part of the results I will present. And yes, I forgot to mention, so this genomic work was done by uh, Charles Perrier during his, uh, his postdoc. Here, what we did is that we used blood samples collected on um, birds, not only in Montpellier, but also in two other cities where there are similar monitorings of great hits in Warsaw and in Barcelona. And so we had 10 urban and 10 forest birds from each of this city. And with these uh, blood samples, we studied genomic and epigenomic traces of uh, adaptation to urbanization. So I'm not going to give you a lot of details, but for those of you interested in terms of looking at the whole genome, we use the RAD sequencing that I mentioned previously uh, in Jason Mucci South study of the white footed mouse, mice. And uh, in terms of studying epigenetic traces, well, we looked at methylation. Uh, because there's growing evidence that su suggests that epigenetic mechanisms such as DNA methylation can be involved in rapid adaptation to new environments, and in particular, air pollution has been demonstrated to cause DNA methylation. So this is why we uh, decided to also look at methylation here in these city birds. So there are, uh, I think, two graphs left. Oh, perhaps a little bit more. <laughs> but. Uh, uh, again, I'm going to walk you through them. Uh, so this is the results on the genetic uh, landscape for these three um, cities. So birds coming from city and forest in these three localities. You have again the female. So each dot here is an individual. It represents its genotype. And the closer two genotypes are, the more similar um, the closer two dots are, the more similar the genotypes are for these two individuals. The further away they are, the more different they are. So you have again the females as triangles, the males are circles, and here uh, the urban individuals are in black, and the rural, the forest individuals are in open dots. And so what this um, uh, graph represents is the factors that explain the genetic differences between individuals. And the first axis of variation here, the RDA1. So RDA is for redundancy analysis, and it's very similar for those of you that know um, to uh, PCAs. And so it investigates the features of um, uh, the landscape or uh, the features that you have fed in the model that explain genetic differences between individuals. And as you can see here, this axis of variation uh, one and two uh, mainly structure the, gen the genotypes by the latitude and the longitude. Uh, you can see that individuals from Montpellier in purple are clustered together. Uh, 
uh, so are the individuals for, uh, from Barcelona and from Warsaw. So two genotypes um, from Montpellier are much more likely to be similar than two genotypes from uh, Warsaw and Montpellier. The third axis of variation, however, was the urban forest contrast. And you might see here uh, with the eyes of faith, I think we say, uh, that um, the, in each of the city clusters, uh, the dots that are full are cl more closely together than the dots that are open. Here again for Warsaw, you have the open dots here and the closed and the full ones here. So that means that the fact that a bird came from the urban or, or forest environment did matter in terms of genotype. And it actually explained 2% of the variance. So it might seem small to you, but it's, it's highly significant. And then finally, there was also uh, the last axis of variation was explained by sex, but this was very small for uh, explaining the genetic differences between individuals. Okay, now if we do the same analysis, but now on the methylation and no longer on the whole genome analysis, well, we have quite a different picture because the first axis of variation here is sex. So I actually didn't know that before starting um, this study on epigenomic variation, but it seems to be a classic example, uh, a classic fact that males and females don't have the same methylation processes. And so, and this is mainly due here, uh, as you can see, to the Z chromosome. So if you, if you look here at the uh, frequency of what we call DMRs, which are the... Um, uh, methylation, uh, I'm sorry, I'm not sure how, how you say it in English, but uh, the methylation regions in the genomes, uh, well, they are very different between males and females, especially on the Z chromosome. And so here again on this picture, what you can see is that all the um, circles are clustered on the right-hand side and all the triangles on the left-hand side. And this is because this axis one here variation is about sex. The second axis, is again about latitude and longitude, so the, the geographic distance between individuals. And then finally, you have the contrast with the urban and forest birds, which again explains around 2% of the variation. So not a lot, but very similar to what we find at the genetic level. I thought I would show you this Sikras plot. I'm not sure whether I have the time, but it's, I think it's a really cool representation of the same results on, on the differentially methylated regions, the DMRs. So, okay, I'm gonna go through it. There's no interaction with the public, so I can go ahead and continue with my complex graphs. So I'm gonna walk you through this. Uh, basically on the outer line here, you have all the uh, chromosomes of the great tit genome. So you have chromosome one here, chromosome two, three, et cetera. One of the characteristics of the bird uh, carrier type is that they have 10 large macro chromosomes, and then they have a whole set of uh, very small micro chromosomes. And this graph represents the hypermethylated sites along these chromosomes, hypermethylated sites in red, and hypomethylated sites in blue for the urban individuals. So in red, the, the sites where the city birds were more methylated than forest birds and in blue the reverse and you have this for the city of Barcelona in the inner circle and then Montpellier and then Warsaw so what is striking here first is that we have we had kind of expected hypermethylation in cities because as I said we know that pollution can lead to methylation but we don't really see that there's almost as many red dots as there are blue dots. So overall, there's no hypermethylation in cities. We also don't really have a lot of evidence for parallelism. I always struggle with this word, um, because if you look at a given site here that is hypermethylated in Montpellier, you will not necessarily find the same site being hypermethylated in the birds from Warsaw or Barcelona. And so what we want to do next, and I'm starting to talk about the perspective here, is to explore whether these DMRs, uh, where they are located on the genome, or they are on exons or introns or non-coding regions. Okay, so to conclude, what I have shown here is that we have a situation with the greatest in the city and the forest where there is strong phenotypic differentiation, pretty much on any of the traits that we have studied on the morphology, the life history, um, or the behaviors. However, uh, these differences in the traits do not seem to be explained by natural selection because natural selection does not seem to favor the craft tricks. I'm sorry. 
uh, natural selection does not seem to favor uh, the urban characteristics in the city. Uh, we also find that there is a, there are small effects of urbanization on the genetic structure and also on the genetic and epigenetic diversity. And what we found is that we mainly, mainly had numerous footprints of selection, both for the epi and genomic footprints. So that means that there are not there is not like a small set of genes that matter for adaptation to city, but it's more likely to be a polygenic response whereby you have a lot of different genes with small effects. And one thing I haven't detailed is that we're starting to see that these genes are very often linked to neuronal functions, which is very interesting for us because it might be linked with the um, observation of different behaviors between the forest and the city birds. Um, I'm not going to skip on that because I think it's interesting. I'll finish with this. So one thing I wanted to uh, talk to you about as a perspective as well is um, the story of the pace of life. So there was this uh, paper published in 2017 by Toolsep, and they reviewed the literature on birds. Uh, they didn't review any data on behaviors, but they reviewed how birds in cities had different life histories and different physiology. And from this review of, uh, I think it was between 10 or 12 studies, they predicted that birds in the city should evolve a slower pace of life. And by this, I mean, slower pace of life means that they should live longer, uh, probably because there is uh, less predation. Uh, they should be shyer and they should have a slower, uh, lower metabolism, uh, lower sensitivity to oxidative stress. Now, if I place our study in this context, what we have found ourselves is that, in fact, the birds in the city, they are not shyer, they are, are in fact, uh, have, they're bolder and they have a higher aggressiveness, and they also have a higher breath rate, which is related to higher uh, sympathetic system reactivity. So one thing that we want to do next is look at all these other traits and understand why in our case, we seem to have birds that have a faster rather than slower pace of life in the city. We started with survival, which is a key feature of the pace of life syndrome. And what we found is that in fact, birds in the city and the forest have very similar survival rates of around 45% from one year to another. If anything, birds in the city seem to survive a little bit less. So next, what we're going to do starting next spring is measure a lot of other traits such as cognition abilities, um, oxidative stress, immune response, and how individuals move er around the city space. So I'm gonna leave you with this perspective and thank you very much uh, for listening to this talk. And of course, I'm, I'm very happy to take questions and debate on, on these results. Thank you very much, Anne, for an absolutely fantastic talk. And that's completely counterintuitive me, to me that city, that city birds live a sower place of life because we always hear about how cities make us all crazy. I've got a few questions. So please do people put your questions in the Q&A box and, um, and I'll relay them to Anne. There's a question from Andrew Planet who asks, um, does epigenetics expressed due to environmental influences accelerate genetic evolution as chance mutations that arise that fixate and reinforce epigenetic adaptations. Yeah, so I'm, I'm not an expert on epigenetics yet, but uh, what has been found is that um, epigenetic mutations are, are probably themselves, they probably have underlying mutations. So there might be genetic determinism in how often a genome can have epigenetic mutations. I'm not sure whether the question is related to that, but in our case, the fact that we have we find that 2% of the genomic variation is explained by this urban forest contrast. And we found that when looking at the methylation, we had the same level of uh, percentage. So also around 2% of AP mutations that were explained by the urban forest contrast. It seems to suggest suggest that perhaps it's in fact the genetic differentiation between the urban and the forest bird that determines this um, AP mutation rate. Um, I'm not sure whether that's clear. Yeah, <laughs> but no, I know, that's interesting. That's a really interesting observation because that would, be, that would mean that the underlying genetics is determining the epigenetics and then and then that's and that's what you see that's really interesting that's very exactly so what we yeah. were hoping in a sense was that or not hoping but what would have been a, a more uh, 
a striking demonstration that the city environment creates EP mutation rates to, to increase would have been to have a 2% uh, genetic variation explained by the urban habitat, but an epigenetic rate uh, much higher than 2%. Then we could have said, well, look, uh, if there's 15% of AP mutation uh, in the city uh, forest contrast, explained by, um, sorry, if there's 15% of the variance in uh, the, AP, uh, the uh, epigenetic marks that is explained by the urban forest contrast, whereas there's only 2% at the genetic whole genome level, then it means that the urban environment does um, uh, induce more AP mutations, which is not what we find. Yeah, that's interesting. Okay, there's a question. It's kind of more of a comment, but I'm going to turn it into a question because actually, I think it actually is a question. Is um that 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 of course phenotypic expression relates to the surrounding environment. So, if cities actually pose a number of threats, survival of course becomes a major factor. Um, so so are stress levels in urban individuals way higher than those from the in the forest or are you is that one of the things you're going to measure next exactly that's one of the i'm actually tomorrow submitting a grant <laughs> to look at uh more physiological approaches that we haven't developed a lot to look at this uh instant stress and long-term stress of the urban environment so one of the difficulty in the urban environment is that as i said there's a cocktail of stresses so it's actually kind of difficult if we find uh that some of the stress related traits um, have higher values in the city compared to the forest, it's difficult to know where it comes from because you have the light, you have the pollution, you have all the noise and the disturbance of people passing by. Uh, so I think we need to uh, go through an experimental approach here. Um, and this is why I'm hoping to do the common garden experiment where we can manipulate some of these parameters and have the birds in, in similar conditions. Yeah, that's um. Yeah, you, you need a, a common bird garden. Sounds great. Um, someone's just asked if you could really simply explain the difference between plasticity and genetic variability, because that's oh yes. Thank you for this question, because in some of these slides, I was thinking, you know, I need to uh, define all these terms, but I don't have time to define them all. So it's very important in, in my work to decipher between the two. So plasticity is about a response at the individual level. So plasticity is when you place one individual um, in one environment and it will have a different phenotype compared to, to when you place it in a different environment. Uh, a very simple example is the, um, do you say chameleon? How do you say that in English? Chameleon. Chameleons, yes. Much nicer so, in French. <laughs> so the uh, chameleons, when you place them in different uh, backgrounds of different colors, they change color. That is plasticity because it's the same genotype that can adjust to different environments. Now, the genetic response of microevolution is because of genetic differences. And so it takes much more time because it's not an individual response, it's a population response. And it's the response that results from natural selection, whereby if you are in a green environment, the green individuals will be favored and the red ones uh, will be predated because they're more obvious. And so at the next generation, only the green individuals will be able to reproduce. And so because green is a genetically determined trait, it will evolve by microevolution. And as you can see, it's the, the individual will not change its color. Um, so it's not plasticity, but it's the population that will change the overall color because of a genetic determinism and the selection removing some of the colored individuals it's difficult to summarize in two minutes hopefully it's clear <laughs> yeah no thank you very much thanks very much and um another question is that um do you know can you think of an evolutionary explanation for the modification of the wings of the difference in the wing in the wing uh ratios between the between the birds from the urban and forest environment yes so actually you know yesterday evening i was reading um this book uh, entitled uh, darwin comes to town from a brilliant author that i can never pronounce his name so <laughs> i'm not going to try um so he's a dutch naturalist that has been working on the urban environment for a long time and i discovered in this book uh, that there's actually another study um i think on uh I don't know. Turdus, uh, I don't know the the um... robins, American robins. Oh, thrushes, thrushes, thrushes. Yes, perhaps. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that was introduced to the states, 
from England, and they discovered that there was also evolution in the cities of the states towards a smaller wing and uh, tail mm -hmm. size relative to the body. And um, what I have heard before is that this is most probably because it, uh, having a shorter tail and a shorter wing provides a higher maneuverability. That's another tricky word. So if you're facing a danger and you need to get away from this danger very quickly, then it's actually much easier to do so and change the course of your flight which, uh, with the shorter wings. Yeah. And it seems yeah. that like airplanes, airplanes are like that too. <laughs> yeah. And so uh, when you're in a forest and the whole environment is pretty uh, similar and you know your way, uh, perhaps having a longer tail, a long mm. wearing doesn't matter so much. But in the city, there's a lot of dangers such as cars passing by or cats coming in. And so I guess in this book, they, they, um, uh, the author stipulates that this evolution is due to uh, the need to have higher maneuverability in the city environment so that you can shift mm -hmm. your your uh, flight more easily. That's great. Padma's just put the link to the book in the Thank chat. You. And Giuseppe has suggested that it's starlings, but I think actually everybody just needs to read the book and then we'll know exactly what bird we're talking about. Okay, so um, it's interesting to know, another question's come in, it's interesting to note the difference in relationship between the number of hatchings, hatchlings and fledglings. Is it that city birds had rel had greater relative success in in bringing up their hatchlings to fledglings, as it yes. appears to me from the graph? And if how come? Yes, thank you very much for uh, uh, spotting this. So indeed, here you have a very strong uh, difference between the number of hatchlings. And when we published this paper, as I said, this was non significant, and that was very interesting for us because it suggested that perhaps city birds are very clever to have smaller clutches. So as I said, they lay on average two, two eggs uh, less than the forest birds. Uh, but this might be because they know that they won't be able to uh, raise so many chicks. And so in the end, they get off pretty well, uh, considering that they have much less uh, eggs, so much fewer hatchlings to feed, but they almost have the same um, number of fledglings. So as I said as well, this number is now more contrasted when we add four years of data and they actually have lower number of fledglings. But wh what we do think is that we think they have adapted their clutch sizes to the city environment, which is of course uh, much more, much poorer, much more, less favorable in terms of um, uh, food abundance for the nestlings, because the main food abundance for the great tits uh, nestlings is caterpillars. And in, in the cities, you don't have a lot of trees, so you don't have a lot of caterpillars. So you might as well have a smaller uh, clutch, because you know that you won't be able to raise 12 chicks, so so you might as well have six or seven. Um, and yeah, it's it was very interesting for us. So now, even though the difference is now significant between forest and city it still means that they have probably adjusted their clutch size so that they can um, evaluate they can manage their effort in in feeding these nestlings someone has said thanks for the great answer about plasticity versus genetic um variability our oh, starling in french is no, so that's what it is. I was okay. what you were saying. So that is that what you mean? Yes. Thank yeah. you. So starlings. So starlings are those birds. Yes. Okay. So Karen has asked: Is do we have any examples for pheno? And I'm not sure I understand this for phenocopy in birds. I'm not quite uh, sure what that means. No, it would be nice to have the person talking about this. I know. Because, I know. It's, um, it's very different. Karen, can you just put in the kind of what do you mean by phenocopy? Do you mean mimicry? Well, while that's happening, Sandy, I have a question. Oh, okay. You go and have your question, Padma, okay. and then Karen can put the put the um the kind of clarification somewhere. <laughs> and I remember there was a, there was kind of a large study that came out a couple of years ago that said that birds were shrinking because of increase in heat. And your study shows that they're so probably to increase surface area to dissipate the heat. Do you think that's the reason why the birds are shrinking? Yes, thank you so much. So actually, I do um, there. And actually, it's not only birds. So this there was a study by Merckx, um, uh, M-E-R-C-X-X, -X, I think, um, across a whole variety of uh, species from invertebrates to birds and mammals. And it does seem like it is a, a case of parallel evolution where all these organisms, when measured in the city and the natural environment, 
shrink in the city. And it's indeed probably, most probably in all these species linked to the um, heat tolerance. And this is one thing I want to do next uh, in the grant I'm depositing tomorrow. I'm asking for funding to look at these uh, thermal tolerance aspects and whether being smaller facilitates adaptation to the heat in the city. Now, what was a bit disappointing for us is that in terms of natural selection, we cannot, as I said, uh, show that being smaller is advantages. So this is a result that I showed with the, the selection here that if you look at the urban um, males and females, here, well, there's no selection for being uh, lighter or, or smaller. There's a slight selection, but it's not very significant. I would have expected here that the city environment, because of this urban heat island effect, would have favored uh, the smaller sized individuals. But for the time being, we don't have a lot of evidence for that. Okay, thank okay, you. I've got, a, I've got a, we have a definition for phenocopy now. Kieran has put it in here. Pheno, phenocopy, the way he's, he, he or she is wanting to, um, the way they're wanting us to explain it is variation in the phenotype, generally referring to a single trait, which is caused by environmental conditions, not often, but not necessarily during the organism's development, such that the organism's phenotype matches the phenotype, which is determined by genetic factors. And his, the example is the Himalayan rabbit translocation experiment. So it's kind of the mimicry of a, of an environmental caused phenotype that actually matches a genetically caused phenotype, but isn't caused by genetics, if you see what I mean. Okay, I'll have to read the definition again, but I don't, I, um, I don't have from the top of my head an example of this in the city environment. There or might be. Birds. I, think, I think they're thinking about birds in general. Okay. So it's not heritable, so it would be something okay. that wasn't heritable. Um, I might have to write down the name of this person and get back to that person after yeah. uh, reading the literature about it. <laughs> okay, great. Thanks. And Andrew Planets has asked another question is, does epigenetic expression um, provide evidence that organisms have evolved more than one genetic, have more, that evolved to have more genetic adaptations than can be expressed at any one time? So does all that expression of, of ep epigenetics mean that there's more adaptation there that can't be expressed at once? Uh, I would have to think about that. I'm not sure I understand the question, but uh, the characteristic of uh, AP mutations are that they are heritable to a certain level. So AP mutations are changes um, that happen not at the DNA level. And so they're not heritable in the classic genetic sense, but they can be transmitted uh, from mothers to uh, offspring. It has been demonstrated even in birds, but uh, the transmission is not perfect and it, it usually wears down after a few generations. So it's, um, it's hypothesized that a lot of the plasticity that we see, and now I've defined plasticity and, and <laughs> genetic differences, could be due to uh, AP mutations. Uh, so it's, it's another way to, uh, for me, it's kind of a, uh, you have uh, long-term genetic evolution via the classic DNA evolution and uh, AP mutations allow for probably faster but less um, permanent changes at the population level. Um, so yeah, I'm not sure I've answered correctly that question. <laughs> well, you've, you've raised some really interesting issues and that, that's, that's really great. And thanks everybody. And Kieran has left his email, so Padma can send it to you. So that's this is a, okay. Thank you. Their email, so we they can do that. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Anne, for a really interesting talk and what fascinating experiments. And I just don't believe it that life is slower in cities. I just don't believe it. So <laughs> I thanks, agree. Not thanks for ever humans. so. Thanks ever so much. And um, and all of you who came, thank you very much for coming. And we hope to see you again at our next evening lecture at the Linnaean Society. So thanks very very much. Thank you very much. Good night. Good night.